I'm being told that we are we are good to go. So first and foremost, I know it's a light crowd, but thank you guys. Light. <laughs> hey, please hold it down. Please. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I promise I'll get to all of it. I would say it's less than light. <laughs> less than capacity, we'll say. Slightly. Uh, but uh, seriously, thank you guys for coming out. Move as close as you would like to. We're yeah. going to have some time for some questions from you guys. Especially my Cleveland Brown man back there now, okay? <laughs> yeah. There you hey, go, man. Hey, first of all, can yes, I introduce sir. somebody? Yeah, absolutely. Tony Hunter, agent to the stars. Nice. Thank you for coming today. We appreciate you. Appreciate you being here, Tony, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, take a bow, Tony. Tony? <laughs> well, you know what? It is a little early, though, because you got it's, the foot. Not trying to make an excuse, but you got the football game today. Tailgate starts at nine o'clock in the morning. The game yeah. starts at twelve. Uh, yeah, I'll go one further. Uh, we're in the Bible Belt. Yes, sir. It's a Sunday morning. That's true. Uh, the in, weather. I used There's to a lot of reasons people couldn't be here today. I'm sure, but again, glad that you guys were able to make it. Glad I was able to make it. Hey, you know what? We no, better get started. We're going to lose what people we have. <laughs> oh, oh yes, by the way, let me make this. Yesterday. Let me make this announcement. I wasn't booked on this particular panel, so don't blame me for this, please. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we well, Steiner, give me, Steiner, give me a clothesline and knock me out before I get out here, please. I take it back. I take it back. I, we, we certainly appreciate you sitting in impromptu and uh, very welcome here on the uh, on the panel. I, obviously, these guys need no introduction, but since I am the official moderator, I guess I will to my immediate left here. Of course, the mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart. Applause. Yes. The sign says applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, in the middle here, we've got uh, the man maybe most famously known as Farouk, uh, but of course, real name Ron Simmons. Thank you, sir, for Thank being you. here with us today. And on the end there, of course, uh, Big Papa Pump, the big bad booty daddy, Scott Steiner. Thanks again to these gentlemen for being here, for you guys being here in attendance. And I want to try to cover a lot of information with you guys if we can. Jimmy, you feel free to jump in because I know you know you know both of these guys very well and you might have some interjections as well. Again, a bit of a surprise. I could go for with you for an hour by yourself and just my childhood memories of watching you on Memphis TV. But we're here to talk to Scott and Ron. So let's get underway now. I'm sure most of you guys probably know this. We've got a couple of All-Americans on the stage today. Ron in football, of course. Scott in wrestling. Scott, at one point, uh, ranked sixth in the nation. And, of course, legend. You don't have to say anything about what school he's from. You know? Okay. Don't, don't mention that. Which, which Florida State? I think it rhymes with the know? University of don't Michigan. Mention but... <laughs> you you know, guys don't, are... don't mention that because it's going to remind me whether you're ranked. You guys are seventh right now, right? Which, which Michigan... Oh, that's two. See, I had to bring that up. Yeah. <laughs> there I'm might be a one-word answer for what you just yeah. did there. Yeah, you know it. <laughs> hey, hey, and I wasn't an All-American, but I did have a million-seller record back in the 60s oh, called yes. Keep on Dancing with the Gentry. The Gentry, <laughs> yes. I want you to that in. So, so whether it was an All-American on the field, on the mat, or on the pop charts, we are well represented today with some great wrestling figures, of course. <laughs> I always like to, and if, if you guys are familiar with wrestling podcasts, you've probably heard this term, so I always like to learn what was your wrestling origin story as a kid growing up before you went to the university, uh, to, to Florida State, before you were at the university of, oh, we won't, we won't say that word again, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> before you were a huge uh, pop star with the Gentries. How did you guys encounter pro wrestling maybe as children? Did you have some favorites growing up? Yeah, well, for me. I, you know, I, I'd always been a fan, right? But my grandmother is the one who was really Same. the biggest fan, man. And I, and this is no joke. When it would come on, right? And it was every Saturdays then, right? And she would make all of us, hey, be quiet. Don't say anything, right? And her favorite, though, was Bob Armstrong, right? And I mean, you know, Bob. Big home, she loved him, right? Mm -hmm. And we would all sit there. And, of course, you know, I became enamored with it because it was physical and I was into weightlifting young kid back then and I just grew up being a fan as I went through other athletics you know football and all that I never lost you know touch with it mm -hmm. right and so that's where how the opportunity when it presented itself right and I was still in good health after you know football so I thought I'd give it a shot and then kept going from there you yes know? sir you certainly did what were who yeah. were some of your favorites as man. a kid growing up oh my man of course like I said right Bob I'm sure Dusty 
you know, came in with the Nature Boy, Junkyard, Ernie Ladd. Hey, you know what I'm saying? I, and I was very lucky to even get a chance to still come in at the time to be able to work with some of them, sure, man, and absolutely. learn from them. So it, it, it was very, it worked out very well, the timing for me. Outstanding. Scott, how were you introduced to wrestling, maybe at a young age? No, I, I, I never got a chance to watch professional really? wrestling. You know, because I was up, up in Michigan. Mm -hmm. You know, basically had two channels, and one was, uh, you know, fuzzy. So we never had we never had wrestling. Really? No, I didn't watch it until I got to college. Okay. And that's when it was exploding. Uh, you know, when Hogan did the, you know, Rocky movie, and everything took off, and that's really the first time I saw it. As such an outstanding amateur wrestler already at that point, did you see a pathway for you to potentially pursue that? No, I had no, no idea, never even thought about it until that happened, and my buddies were talking, that'd be a great way to make a living, you know? Absolutely. So then uh, my brother was into it too, and actually my brother went first. Went up to Minnesota with Brad Reinigans, uh through uh, uh, George Animal Steel in Michigan, from, from the area, same area. Mm -hmm. And uh, I watched it a few times when I was in college, which was pretty cool. And then uh, uh, I started right after college, started wrestling, started training. And then I started with Dick the Bruiser, which, you know, pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and then went from there. Then I went to Memphis with Waller oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Jarrett. And then uh, I spent there like 10 weeks, 10 months there. And then I went, met up in uh, the NWA. Outstanding. Outstanding. Jimmy, how, how did you get introduced well, to this when industry? We, right out of high school, we were on tour with uh, the Beach Boys. We are doing that Dick Clark stuff. And I always loved the wrestling because Jerry Lawler and I went to high school together. So he was on the wow. local wrestling show. He went to wrestling. I went to music. But we were on the bus tours. I remember us being down in Atlanta, places like that. So I turned the TV on early in the morning, Saturday mornings before we do the show. That's when I got to see Dusty Rhodes. And I go, oh, man, I love this. Then if we were in Carolina, of course, it was Ric Flair. In Texas, it was either Von Erichs or the Funks. So I'd always loved it. And then finally got into it through Jerry the King Lawler. Uh, he wanted to do a, a wrestling album, and I helped him with it. And the next thing you know, I'm doing the stuff in Memphis for six years. And then I got the call from Howard Finkel that saw me on the show, and Vince picked the phone up and called me. And the next thing I know, I'm in New York. So the rest was kind of history. Absolutely. And what great history you guys all made in the industry for sure. Uh, Ron, I know uh, we talked about All-American at FSU. A couple of years in the NFL, uh, three years, I think, in the USFL. And I noticed a note... <laughs> yeah, 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 Browns, absolutely. I noticed a note that said you had a teammate in the USFL by the name of Lex Luger. Is that where you first met Lex? Yeah, uh, well, no, actually, we played on the uh, in the USFL for three years there. Yeah. He and I did, yeah. right. And, and so, and he was my gateway into. That's That was going to be my follow-up, right, had he right, already. Yeah, right, because after the USFL folded, right, and, and I think Luger had got into probably about a year and a half. Mm -hmm into it, right? And at that particular time, you know, the most prominent person probably was Junkyard. Yet Butch was, you know, doing his thing in there, right? So it wasn't really many black men that was really in it at that point. And at that time, Hiro Matsuda was the trainer of Luger. So when they was looking for another, you know, black, more black guys and women to get into it, you know? So he approached me with it, man. And hey, you know, and I had already been a big fan and that was perfect opportunity for me to come in, you know, with Hiro Matsuda, who had also trained him. And so, and that's really how, how, that, how it really came about, you know? Awesome, awesome. Thank you. Uh, both of you, um, whoever wants to go first, feel free to jump in. But how did the correlation from your amateur wrestling training or your football training, how did that carry over from a discipline mindset maybe or also just a, a physicality how did that translate into the wrestling business for you guys? Scott can tell you more about that. Okay. Wrestling. Yeah, I, I did a lot of those suplexes from my amateur, you know, like a step around suplex I always did was from my Greco coach. And uh, he was actually the first American to win an Olympic gold medal in, for the United States in the Olympics in uh, uh, California. So even though I didn't like wrestling, I wrestled with him. To help him train, mm -hmm. so I picked up a few things, and uh, yeah, that was one of the moves I did. So a lot of those suplexes I did in college, so I you know brought them to the pro ranks. So I right know. 
you know? Yeah, yeah. And for me, the, the, <clears throat> the physicality of it, right, mm -hmm. you know, with the football and the wrestling, you know, they right there parallel, you know, they complement each other. Sure. So that was a plus for me coming into it and just the athleticism, you know, and I've always been an athlete all my life. So it was just something more and it's more challenging because it was every day. You know what no I mean? No off-season. Yes, and yeah. sometimes <laughs> twice a day. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So, it, yeah, so it, it was a little bit more challenging in that way. Right. And looking over some notes, uh, I noticed when you guys first started, you had some singles action and then had some success as a tag team. Uh, Scott, for you first, was it always the, the goal or part of the plan, at least, to tag team with your brother? Yeah, that was the only goal. The only reason I really got into it to tag my brother. Uh, but... I, at the time, he was with Bill Watts in the UWF, and then he went to NWA. And then I had to, you know, breaking in, I had to get better, you know. So that's when I started with Dick the Bruiser, and it got better. And then went to Memphis, and it got a lot better because they wrestled every day. Didn't get paid, <laughs> <laughs> but he wrestled every day. And then, uh, like I said, 10 months there, and I was ready to go. And then that's when we tagged up in the, in the NWA. Outstanding, outstanding. And, and Ron as well, you started early yeah. on, primarily as a singles, but yeah. uh, fairly early on also right. got uh, right. hooked up with Butch Reed yeah. and, and Doom. Right. Well, it was, you know, well, well, back then, brother, listen, once you got the training and you'd better catch on, you, you know what I mean? They wasn't babysitting you all the way through this, you mm -hmm. know? It was learning as you go along. and, and On being, the job training. Right, and being a student from and to learn from the guys who'd come before you, you know? Right, so that's what I really took a lot of time and took a lot of pride and thank God that a lot of them took an interest in me and would take the time with me, you know? And I was really lucky, though, to get with Butch and, and all the great tag partners I've had coming up, you know? Yeah, so, so that worked out really good. It did. It did worked out well for both of you in the in the tag ranks for sure. Uh, Jimmy, I know uh, Scott mentioned he had been in Memphis for a while. Did you were you able to cross paths with Scott then? When did you first meet these gentlemen? I think gentlemen? I'd already left Memphis and to go to New York. Mm -hmm. I, I think because I started in, uh, with with Jerry back in '79 down there, and um, that was you know we had people like you know like Austin Idol and Handsome Jimmy Valiant and Joe LaDuke and all the guys came in that, that I was connected with then. And I had, matter of fact, I had King Kong Bundy there before he went to New York. I also had the Iron Sheik in oh, Memphis yeah. before he went to New York. And yeah. Rick Rude, I managed him. In, so many guys came you know, to so Memphis, a lot of the guys, sure. And Jim Neidhart. So a lot of the guys that went to New York later on, I had in Memphis. So then when I got the call to go to New York, they gave me uh, King Kong Bundy first. So King Kong Bundy and I were on the very first WrestleMania. Then I had Neidhart. Later on, we put Bret Hart with us. But Greg the Hammer Valentine was one of the first people I had up there, too, who was also on the first WrestleMania. So uh, I was lucky to be part of that. You know, my Memphis experience was was great. Like he said, we didn't make a lot of money, but we had a lot of work going on and and kind of helped pave the way for us to be able to go to New York and, and places like that. Getting those reps in on the microphone, in the ring, that really helped you kind of develop your skills and paid off later Absolutely. down the road for you guys, for sure. Uh, you guys hit... WCW, Jim Crockett Promotions, NWA. There are a few different name changes right in that area, but you guys hit close to the same time and had some great battles as the Steiner Brothers and Doom uh, early on at a uh, uh, after a parking lot assault on one Scott Steiner. Uh, Doom picked up a big win. That was when you guys were really kind of just getting started with woman as your manager. Speak to a, a little bit about the formation of Doom and, and working with woman as your first manager. Magical time, man. Listen, I, I could spend an whole day just talking about, you know, having the opportunity to work with, well, you know, with women and men and such as we're calling her woman at this point, right? It, it was a learning experience for me. Okay. Because she had been in the business, right? And, and can offer a lot of tips to me. You know, not just coming from me and then, which was very helpful for me in the ring. And then not only that, but getting an opportunity to go on and then start working with Rick and Scott. Well, I, I could have done that the rest of my career, <laughs> to be honest with you, because things were, it was just a good time to be in the business then, right? And then it was just a great opportunity for me to continue learning 
you know, as I was going along. And what better way to keep it going than with Rick and Scott? You know? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, as a fan, we would have loved to have seen yeah. that for 20 or 30 years. You guys are awesome. Uh, also, uh, uh, good to see that after all these years, after that parking lot of salt, that you guys have been yeah. able to put that bad <laughs> blood behind you. Um, also, uh, February 1990, Clash of the Champions, Steiner Brothers get the win, but a big stipulation here. You guys had to unmask. You guys started. Hey, you know, oh man, my God. Nobody knew who we were. Nobody. And no. Nobody had a guess who we were, man. They look you better know? with the mask on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, only two big black guys in the bit, but nobody knew who we were. You know? But you know the funniest thing about that, right? And this is a testament to how magical the times were back then, right? it still was working with the fans, you know? So that is a testament to who you're working with, you know? Absolutely. Right, in order to make something like that, continue to be interesting to the fans, hey, man, it, it speaks volumes about having the opportunity to, to work with them, you know? Yeah, it's like when you got good guys, you got bad guys. If the good guys don't have a legitimate bad guys, the people ain't going to care. Yeah. Like, there's nothing better than Butch and... and uh, Ron here to have an opponent because they, you know, they were, they looked legit. Right. They, were, they weren't legit. And when they look like they're badasses and they, and they were, it's like, so that makes the show all the whole, that much yeah. better. That, I, that's a great point about kind of how the business used to be. And I don't, I don't want to get too sidetracked here, but I'm curious what you guys think about the modern product. Um, how do you feel it compares to the era when you guys were coming in? Just any thoughts you have to share on, on what you're seeing on TV today? I, I'm very fortunate to have came along when I did. I, and I just simply being honest with you, you know, I don't think it's going to get any better, you know, or you will see any better athletes or wrestlers because, in my opinion, it was the true professional wrestling Right. What you, what I came along in seeing, mm -hmm. okay? Now, that's just me. I'm prejudiced for at that time and, and all the people who I work with, and I am just telling the honest truth. I don't, wouldn't trade that in for anything, man. I'm really fortunate in that regard. Yeah. Outstanding. Thank you. <clears throat> Scott? Yeah, you know, ev evolution start with everything. You know, mm -hmm. it happens. You know, mm -hmm. And sometimes that's not a good thing. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? So, I, I like Ron. It was great to... Uh, and Russell, when we did, uh, you know, everybody's trying to move it forward, but now it's it's, uh, uh, it's too comical, hard to watch. Yeah. You know? But uh, not yeah. to use a word you used a minute ago. The sometimes it doesn't seem as legit. Mm. Oh, without a doubt. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> safe to say, yeah. maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I think our, our crowd agrees. Now, uh, uh, just real quick to wrap up uh, with the tag team scene in WCW, uh, Doom won the titles with their new manager, Teddy Long. Right. And I know there had been uh, some kind of swirlings. Teddy had gotten fired and then came back to manage you guys. What was it like working with Teddy Long? Yeah, well, Teddy, was a, it, it was the same thing, mm -hmm. man, as, a, as opposed to, you know, when I was speaking to a woman right with, with her, he... Teddy was a very well accomplished person in his own right. He done everything in the business you can do. Hey, he referee. You understand? He come along, been in position of being general managers, right? And put, he's seen a lot. Ring. Yeah, put, yeah, put a, he, he did it all. Yeah. You know, pull the truck like Scotty said, put the rings up, everything, man. So it was another learning experience for myself and to learn from him and Butch. You know, so it was a yeah, hey, brother. I learned a lot from him. You know, so it was a great thing, and I think that had a lot to do with personally for myself, you know, to help you know elevate me and keep me going. You know, yeah, it was a great, great experience, man. Outstanding, outstanding. Now, you stayed with WCW for a few more years, but Scott, you and Rick made the jump to WWE. There was word of a contract dispute at WCW, but bottom line was you guys left for the WWF. What was the uh, what were some of the differences that you noticed from the WCW atmosphere to that WWF atmosphere in the, say, mid-90s, early mid-90s? Well, when we left WCW, there was a lot of things going on. It's like from the day we got, that I got there, there was always talk of, you know, Turner execs not liking wrestling. There was always talk of their, they want to get rid of wrestling. And after hearing that for like, you know, four or five years and on the verge of not, really not doing that great a business, and then it just so happened, Bill Watts came in, and we didn't see eye to eye, and so 
I thought it was time for us to make a change, so we, that's what we did. You absolutely did, and almost a monumental change for your career. Um, there was a rumor that you were in discussion to win the Royal Rumble and then head into WrestleMania 9 where you would take the World Heavyweight Championship. Now, that, as we know, that wasn't the case, but could you tell us a little bit about entering the WWF and what the plans were and maybe why those were, um, that was, didn't become the eventual uh, game plan? I mean, I heard those talks too, but that was after the fact. Those okay. discussions were, weren't held with me. Gotcha. So I had no, uh, no knowledge of that. Gotcha. Would but, you Would you have been open to splitting up the tag team at that time for such an honor? Uh, maybe if they were presented it that way, mm -hmm. but if they would just said, we want to split your bro you and your brother up, I wouldn't have done it. Yeah. I did. They actually wanted us to fight Yeah. in the Royal Rumble and we refused to do it, you know? Okay. So I wasn't ready to, uh, leave, uh, the tag team scene until eventually when I did. Sure. Because at that point we had wrestled everybody and it was like, you know, spinning our wheels. So it was time to make a change. Plus, you know, that's, I was ready for a change, you know? Sure. And, and you both had a couple of stops in, in a couple of the same locations, New Japan, uh, also ECW. Very short stints, but you, could you tell us a little bit about your time with, with those organizations? Oh, it's always good, you know, to, to uh, and anyone getting in this business, when the opportunity presents itself for you to do travel and get the experience from not only, a, well, back then you could have went from state to state, <laughs> you know, sure. right, and, and, uh, and it would have been different in style and wrestling, right? And then, not needless to mention, when you travel out of the country, totally different, right? As in, like Japan, you mentioned, right? Yeah, great experience, loved it all. Every time the opportunity presented itself, I love, I, you know, I, I love to take it on, right? And it was a great experience into ECW, you know? Of course, it was much more of a object, you know, thing there other than just a technical wrestling. Mm -hmm. But it was a good experience, though, because you got to sometimes in a match, you know, Add all those things, interject different things. So it was a, you know, it was, it was a good stop. Right on, Scott. Yeah, we when we left the WWF, that was our main contract with with New Japan. Plus, we had done it with the WCW when we wrestled Hashi and Saki, the Tokyo Dome, you know, seventy two thousand people. Right. And we had a couple good matches there, so I love that style. It was matched our style a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said. For two years, we just went for that. And that's what the time we went to ECW, we just did like one or two matches mm -hmm. just to help out Paul Lee and ECW. And then, of course, you know, checks bounced. So that was the last, <laughs> <laughs> that was the last uh, time we went to yeah, yeah, right. Under, Understandably so. <laughs> yeah. you know, but we did yeah. to help Paul Lee. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I mean, sure. Yeah, I, I'm not going to wrestle for free. Yeah, that's right. True. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's a difference between not making yeah. much in Memphis and not right. making anything. Right. <laughs> Literally bouncing around. Right. Right. Yeah. But I, I, I didn't hold that against Paulie because, yeah. you know, he was doing a good thing there. Yeah. Unfortunately, he couldn't, uh, yeah. you know, didn't have no money to pay. Yeah. Right. So, and it didn't really hurt. I mean, it was like, there's a freebie for him. Some so, visibility he, as well. Yeah, he owes yeah. me a thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, uh, Ron, before you left WCW, you made quite an accomplishment for yourself, uh, for, African -Amer for African Americans in the industry. Um, tell me a little bit about what happened at the house show where it was supposed to be Sting versus Vader, yeah. but Jake Roberts, that dastardly heel, took out Sting before the match could take place, and and you filled in, kind of describe that that day for us. How were you well, told? Well, when did you, you know, learn? It, well, actually, you know what? It, you know, and I've told this story, and each time I tell it, I'm telling the truth, right? Uh, there was no uh, idea my, from myself or anyone, none of us, the boys, anybody, knew about what was going to take place. Hell, I don't even think it was until we got up to that moment, right? Mm -hmm. And and when this took place, and he just came in, right, and said, hey, you are gonna be up for the, you know, for the title tonight. I'm, what are you talking about? I'm working mid-card at this point and trying to work my way up, you know? And so, hey, it literally was a thing when he just said, we're gonna put your hat in for this title, mm -hmm. right? So I'm like, well, a hat in, so that's cool. You know, so we threw in all different guys into, sure enough, a lottery. I'm, I'm the one, 
You know, wait, wow. right, yeah, and that's how that went down. It wasn't a pre-planned thing coming into it or any knowledge of it at all. And I think that's why you see the reaction that you get, you know, each, each time you watch it. And it, it's a real, genuine reaction, man. And I miss those, period, you know, from the times back then. And so it, it, it was real special, you know. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. no doubt about it. Um, I see. Uh, around uh, 1996, you guys, uh, Scott, you make your way back to WCW. Ron, you make your way to the WWF. Uh, I want to start with Ron. You you enter in as Farouk. Right. You have Sonny as your manager. Right. Um, not the most successful run of your career, but a way to kind of introduce you to a new audience, so to say. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about that initial oh, run? I, if, well, at the moment, right, mm -hmm. being honest with you, went all on board with the gimmick part mm -hmm. of it, right? But I wouldn't trade it now for anything because it was just part of what we spoke of earlier about the training process uh, when Hero and he had briefly mentioned that back at the early part of this, hey, you're going to encounter some things you ain't going to be on board with. Right. Now, how you're handling it and what you do with it is what is going to be the success you get out of it. So... What you do and what I had to do at that point was take this and put another spin on that character and make it work. Now, had I not done that, then I'm not talking to you now. Exactly. You, understand you definitely me? made it so, work. So, right. <laughs> so, as bad as it might have seemed for me then, it was even better right. than it was because had I jumped out the gate with something else, who knows, right? Exactly. So, it was a good experience for me in that way. Right on. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not every everything you get presented to you, yeah. you like. Yeah, sure. You know, and they're saying you can't make chicken right. out of chicken right. salad. Yeah. But, you know, so, but you, sometimes you got to try. Yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes you, some, you got to take a big bite and smile. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> yeah, because I, uh, man, I used to show up uh, for those nitros. And it was just, uh, I would be so pissed off because of the that they wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. But you couldn't be a, you know, couldn't be a yeah. You know, you, you know, so it, I made it to work out to where it came to where I, I yeah, felt right. comfortable with it. You know? Absolutely, so, and feel feel free to elaborate that on on that some more. As you were making your way back into WCW, what had changed from when you previously left? Where I think you were basically saying it always felt like the axe was ready to fall on the the entire company. What had changed in that time when you came back to WCW? Well, at that point. Uh, I think Eric Bischoff was in charge, you know, and he had a total different mindset because, uh, you know, I don't want to get into it too much, much of it, but you know, the, not everything was done to make business. A lot of things they were do to put the screws to you, yeah. Yeah. you know, to f with you, you know, and he, so and Eric wasn't a part of that. He was all about trying to make money. You know, that's why a lot of that stuff, and he didn't put up with that old school screw you you know, you know, all the politics behind closed doors, you know, which was prevalent in wrestling and everybody had to put up with it. Yeah, so, sure. uh, and yeah. that was probably the main difference. Yeah. yeah. Um, so as you made your way back into, uh, WCW, you were teaming with your brother. You guys were working against guys like Harlem heat, uh, a lot of great tag teams going into the WCW lineup at that time. Uh, but eventually you would feud with your brother briefly and kind of break out on your own again, emerging uh, as Big Papa Pump. Talk about the evolution of that character, the look, um, how, how that kind of all kind of came to fruition for you. Yeah, when they, you know, it was, it was time for me to change, you know. I was getting pretty much sick of everything, you know, so I had a different attitude at that point. And that's that's really why I changed, went blonde. You know, as soon as I I did that that night, turned on my brother, I you know bleached my hair because I knew I couldn't go out there and try to be the same guy. You know, happy-go-lucky college kid. You know, sure. and so I just tried to turn, you know, do a 180 degree. You know, and uh, and try to just make the people hate hate me. You know, which is was easier for me to do. It was. I much, had a much more time, harder time make people like me. I thought I, that wasn't my personality, you know. Mm -hmm. So that that worked out that way. And but you still, you know, they still try to put the screws to you, you know. My, like my first singles match uh, at a at a, a Great American Bash or a pay per view, I lost. Like, 
don't, you don't do that to the first guy who just, you know. Just repackage. Yeah, just repack. Yeah. You know, you lose it. I'm going to say, is this more, you know, you try to make chicken salad out of chicken, you know. Right. So I just kept on working on the character and stuff like that and right. tried to, you know, work on my interviews, try to be a bastard. And uh, people it took off, you know. Absolutely. So, you didn't have to work too hard. No. <laughs> <laughs> now, at, at the same time frame, you're you're yeah, now yeah. in the WWF at the time as yeah. as Farouk, uh, Scott. You're I, back I'm in just w- like, I'm, Listen, I'm right along the lines where Scotty was as, as mad as I could damn yeah. be. Okay. <laughs> some right. some, some yeah. people can hide you know their. What I mean, yeah, it was natural. Like, yeah. The yeah. things I say out yeah. in person, like yeah. interviews, like he feels the same way. Yeah. But he, He's not, that's not his personality, yeah. you know. But you know? we all got put sh- the same way, yeah. right? You know. Yeah. Right. So, so it, it is exactly as he's speaking of now, and which worked out for both of us. Yes. Because we were already steaming from some things we didn't like, mm-hmm. right? So now we're getting an opportunity to be heels. Hell, you couldn't ask for anything better than that. Because <laughs> listen, it was natural. Yes. <laughs> you, you know, it was a natural thing. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So it worked out good. Yes, yeah. and thank you both for persevering yeah. through those hard times <laughs> and, and delivering. Yeah, um, you know. But at, at that time, both companies, the industry yeah. in total, was just on fire. Uh, 1996, the rise of, of the NWO, of Stone Cold Steve Austin, hot on the heels of that, the rock right behind him. How was it to be... In WCW, in WWF, when they were butting heads and this Monday Night War was going on, just magical stuff, man. You know what I'm saying, mm-hmm. right? That that's the that's the that's the period of times, you know, which Jimmy, all of us yes. were talking about. Yes. You you know, real. It, it's the wrestling professionally. Mm-hmm. You understand that, that, that it just doesn't get any better. You know, and, and to be honest with you, I don't see it getting any much better than during that period. Right. You know, yeah, it, it was crazy. It was, yeah, it's like. You know, the ratings are yeah. through, were through the roof, like set record numbers that would probably never be seen again. Yeah. And then they go on to, instead of going from, you know, arenas, outdoor stadiums, indoor stadiums, like in St. Louis and Atlanta, for a Monday Night Nitro, not a pay-per-view, a regular Monday Night show. So, it, yeah, and the merchandise that was being sold, you know, the, it was it was great when I yeah, did man. NWO and stuff. Was, yeah. Everything just took off. Yeah, good and, time, man. Yeah, it's and and Jimmy, I know you were right there in the thick of it as well in the nineties. Well, when the NWO first started, mm. I'm the one that ran through the ring first and goes, "They're coming! They're coming! The NWO's <laughs> coming!" Stings in the ring, everybody's in the ring. I cut right through the ring. If you look at the tape, then I ran out the back door. They're coming! They're coming! Everybody's looking around going, what, that was my job. To do the town crier. Yeah, the town crier. <laughs> and so that's when it all kicked off on that, and the rest was history. But to this day, the NWO T-shirt sales and merchandise they have is still going strong. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's the credibility of what all those guys did back in the day. Yeah, yeah. definitely uh, the NWA uh, sparked kind of that, that rapid growth for the industry at that time, and, and neither company let off the gas. Um Farouk, as part of the Nation of Domination, originally that's you, Crush, and Savio Vega. Right. That lineup lasted for a little while. You parted ways, started sort of a, a kind of a gang faction storyline amongst the, the WWF at that time. And then you had some new recruits. Yeah. Uh, Ahmed Johnson, briefly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Owen, had, we had a lot, a lot of guys had yeah. brief stops in there, man. It's just like, but it's just like Jimmy is speaking of, you know, Hey, it's a testament to, hey, even to this day, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? It's still relevant with people, and uh, and you it you just can't get any better than that. Because that lets you know that, hey, it was, it was a good thing, and that people enjoyed watching it and seeing it, you know? Sure. Yeah. So it, it, it was just good, man. Some quick word associations with some of your former Nation of Domination yeah. uh, affiliates. Yeah. Crush. Yeah, all of them, man. Great guy. You understand me? You could go on naming each one of them, and it wouldn't get any better for a group of guys to form a faction with than I had the, the, you know, the privilege of working with. Mm -hmm. Crush, great, fantastic guy. Always willing and open for learning and interjecting new ideas. Mark Henry, Savio, God, Rock, D'Lo, you you could go on. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? uh, Every one of them. You know, all great guys. I'm sure there's two specifically I want to ask you about. The first one, uh, Owen Hart. 
Uh, Didn't seem like he would be the guy to fit into the nation of domination. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but guess what? But you made it That's work. That's what made it work even better yeah. because he seemingly looked like it wouldn't be the, the guy that fit at all, which made him fit better yeah. in it, you know, because people weren't looking at it. And you're talking about somebody that always was there for you, man, and would interject a joke and, you know, and keep the, the locker room full of laughter. And when you was feeling bad, he, he, he was uh, very, very integral, good in, interjection into the group that kept things going and kept it fresh, you know? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and of course, got to ask about The Rock. The whole storyline of of you being the leader initially and him kind of trying to, to circumvent your control. Uh, how, how awesome was that storyline? And to watch him emerge well, into a superstar. The, let's go from the beginning a little bit more mm -hmm. when they were trying to get to the point to where they could form an identity for him. Right. All right. So this is where the nation came in for him. Mm -hmm. All right. In which he was open to learning things and coming in and asking ideas of what he thought would work for him. And hey, and it was a way for him to come in to form his own identity from that. And which he did. Absolutely. Right. So it worked out perfectly for him in that regard. And everyone else went on to do good. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Scott, at the same time, you're again in WCW. You guys are doing gangbusters. At, at uh, some point, you start aligning yourself with the NWO. It always felt like you had enough heat on your own to not be a part of the NWO. Was there any resistance on your part to, to join in the group, or were you welcoming it with open arms? No, that was the whole idea to join them. Mm -hmm. Because the match was against Kevin Ness and Scott Hall. Sure. You know? So, no, that was the whole point. Uh, of doing it, uh, no, I'm, and I was glad I got put in. So, mm -hmm. like I said, you, you can't beat those those days, you know. It's yeah. Like yeah. Magical, you know. Yeah, it's for just, real. Just and you can't argue with it because the numbers and the, the attendance and stuff like that. Absolutely. Right? And, and and same sort of the same question. Uh, quick word association with some of your NWO members: Scott Hall, Kevin Nash. Well, they, uh, I think people do give them recognition, but. The point is, they did change the industry. Yeah. Because when they came down, they forced WWF, WWE now, to ha doing uh, guaranteed contracts. Mm -hmm. And that, was, that wasn't the case before. So they really did change the in industry, you know, so. For a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. Not Absolutely. Yet. Not just for them. Yeah. They helped everybody. Everybody, yeah. You know what was cool, too? When they came over, they really left on top over. Because mm -hmm. usually guys jump from territory to territory when they're not doing very much. Right. But what they brought over too, they were cool, they were cocky, they had certain wit about them, and people really liked that. You know, there was just, these guys were so, the NWO was so strong that people fell in love with them. Yeah. You know, you get you gotta have a, a bad guy that people really hate so much, and then when you switch them babyface, people love them and vice versa. But when all these guys came over together, it was unreal. You know, I did a lot of the theme songs. I did the mm -hmm. Whoopack yes. song for Nash and Hall. But what happened, I took it to Nash, and he goes, you know, I like it. He said, see what kept, see what Scott thinks. I took it to uh, uh, Scott, and Scott goes, sweet, you know, do the thing. And then Eric liked it, too, so we cut it. But here's a good one. Scott Steiner needed a theme song, right? And I said, Scott, what do you want? He goes, I want a siren. I went, what? He well, said, hold up. He said, I at just, that time, I was getting arrested a lot. So right. he, said, I just, he said, I just want a siren. So I got the best siren we could. They go, oh. But you know what? It worked. That's what he wanted. We gave it to him. But boy, when that thing hit, everybody knew, here comes Scott Steiner, man. Yes. So it was great. They knew business was indeed about to pick up. You know, I want to say this, too, because mm -hmm. I know time's getting short. But I've had such a you know privilege for me working in WCW with everybody. And then when I was in WWF, when I first went up there, it was such a thrill to me. You go into a dressing room and there's Andre the Giant playing cards over in this corner every night with Arnold Skolan. And over here, you got the honky tonk man tuning his guitar. You got Nikolai Volkov in the Iron Sheik. Nikolai's practicing the Russian national anthem was really what the Russian national anthem, he didn't really know the words to it, but he was working on it every night going, Jimmy, I think I'm horse tonight, I'm horse tonight. And then you had the, the Bulldogs with Matilda feeding her. And then you had Bobby Heenan telling jokes. 
Mr. Fuji playing tricks on everybody. Jake the Snake in the corner with Damien, you know, putting him in the bag. But it was just such a thrill to me to be part of that experience and to be part of WCW and to still be part of doing what, what we do now and go out and do the Comic-Cons and stuff. And still, when WWE calls, I still go out and do radio and TV for them promoting everything. And so I just wanted to say before we close today that... And plus, thank all you guys out here because if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be up here now. So God bless you and thank you so much. Give Ab yourself a nice round of applause. There you go. Yes, absolutely. You deserve it. Thank you. And we will take a few minutes for crowd questions. So if you have a question that you've been uh, holding on to, be ready for that in just a few moments. Uh, I don't think so. I think we. I think I've been told that the mics up here will be loud enough to pick everything up. So we should be good to go there. Um, uh, Ron. Your, your time, your, the rest of your time with the WWF, of course, uh, the, the Acolytes, right. uh, which then got folded into the Ministry of Darkness. Uh, talk about your, your time with JBL, a couple of tag title reigns, but you, you evolved from almost a, a, a cult-like tag team uh, with the symbols yeah. into basically just beer-drinking, cigar-smoking buddies that would whip your ass. <laughs> well, we just morphed into ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> it's what really happened, you know. Well, I, he had been through several uh, tag partners, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I had some, some bits and pieces of success here and there, right? And, of course, he and I got similar background. He's a football player, you know, and me coming from the same thing. Personalities were, were similar outside of the ring. And so when they said uh, that, hey, well, what about if we just put these guys together? And I don't think anybody, to be honest with you, were thinking that the success we had, had was going to come about. But from the moment he and I got together, we knew that we had something there. Because if you've been in a tag before, and Scott can attest to this, having been with his brother and briefly with some others, right, you, it, you can feel it. You can feel it if it's going to work, man. Right, and within that short period of time we were together there, we knew what we were on to something there, right? And that it was going to, and it was clicking with the people, right? Because I think that what caught on with him was the geniality. It was real. You understand? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. The interaction, not yeah. only in the ring but outside right. the ring Absolutely. as well. Right. You guys look like best friends. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Scott, yeah, you made, you did make your way after the the sale of WCW back to then the WWF. You eventually did make your way back in around, I believe, two thousand three. Ish, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, short stint. Um, I know there's been some some uh, rumors about what happened or didn't happen during that, but just give us a, a brief uh, explanation about that last run with the WWF and how that went for you. Uh, you know, I wish it probably wouldn't have happened uh, at all. No, okay, but unfortunately, I had at that I had accumulated a lot of injuries, and probably the worst one I had was was my, fo my foot. I mean, my foot is still paralyzed. I mean, it still don't work that great. Uh, but when I went up there, it was totally paralyzed. It would flop and, until after I got surgery, you know, when I left. But, uh, yeah, just, the, unfortunately, it's like I was hindered by those, those injuries. That, and that one's, you know, if you don't have a foot, it's kind of hard to move, you, you know sure. what I'm saying? So that's why I had... I moved better when I went to TNA because I had got that surgery and I could, you know, because I had to wear a brace and I taped it up like it was a cast just to get through. And if I watch those those matches, I mean, even when I walked down the ring, it's I cringe because it looked like it, I could tell my my walk my gait wasn't right. I wasn't walking the same way I always used to did, but I couldn't. There was nothing I could do about it. So yeah. I, I wish I would have been healthy, you know, because one of my first introduction was in that Madison Square Garden and you know it got a pretty good response and uh and it went downhill from that you know yeah it was a, an outstanding response no doubt um and I wish it could have been a little bit longer wish you'd been in better shape to to really yeah, kind of make unfortunately injuries yeah. happen yeah and you know you know not having a foot you know Limits, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm glad you were able to rebound. Loved your time in TNA. The main event mafia was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. Main, um, event, main event mafia was fun, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and again, I could I could, I could, could sit up here all day if these guys would let me, but I do know that we are running out of time. We do need to get some to some fan questions. Just to wrap up real quick, three Hall of Famers right here, folks. Give them a big round of applause. 
Uh, just briefly before we get to those fan questions, start with you, Jimmy, and we'll work our way across. What was the process like for them to notify you, hey, we want you in the Hall of Fame, and what does that mean to you in your career? Well, first of all, the Hall of Fame means everything. I tell you, when Jr. called me and said, Jimmy, Vince called, he wants to induct you in the Hall of Fame, I thought they had me mixed up with Bret Hart. I said, you sure it's not Bret Hart? He goes, no, it's you, Jimmy. Bret Hart came in a few years later, but so grateful because... You know, this really, I still wear this today. It means so much to everybody because we're all like a big fraternity. And uh, like I said before, it just means so much to be put in. I went in in 2005, and, and I've been so grateful ever since. Outstanding. Yeah, I mean, it's not too much more, man, I can say, except for kind of echo what Jimmy is saying, right? And, and I, like I've said earlier, I've been an athlete all my life. I've had the good fortune of going into quite a few Hall of Fames, right? Football, college football, Hall of Fame, it's college football, FSU, you name it, right? But nothing can compare to when you've idolized some people growing up, like I spoke of earlier, Dusty, all of these guys, Flair, all these guys, and now my name is mentioned in somewhat of the same sentence with Jimmy and all these. It's it's still you still you still be honest with you don't get used to it, you know. So that's the best part about it. Yeah, it's quite a quite an accomplishment. Yeah, like Ron is like I'm in the Michigan Hall of Fame, also Dan Gable Hall of Fame, yeah. which is you know, he was legendary coach from Iowa, who I had to compete compete against his teams. So and they won like 13 national championships. A lot of them were in a row, and so but the the best thing about the WWE Hall of Fame was my brother's boy got to introduce us, which is cool. You know, he's, he's doing really good NXT. So that made it special, you know? So, you know, cause you know, there's blood, you know? So. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, do we have some fan questions that we want to get to? Anybody have a, come on up, sir. I'll let you speak into the mic just in case. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you everybody for being here today. It's uh, thank you for the memories. Uh, my first question was for uh, Ron and Scott as uh, athletes, champions, achievers, what, what was your day-to-day -day motivation? Like what drove that uh, passion to keep climbing the mountain? Uh, and my question for Jimmy Hart is uh, you were part of WrestleMania three. Uh, that's actually something vividly that still I remember with my grandfather he was the one who uh, showed me about wrestling and I was a little kid when I was watching that and just watching the amount of people uh, everything part of that show was you know it, it, it was incredible so just wanted to get your thoughts on that experience well first of all WrestleMania 3 everybody goes what did you think about it I didn't have time to even see it because I had three matches on there I was too busy changing jackets because that was my kind of forte I'd go out, get beat up. I'd come back like a different character, put a little freeze and shine on my hair, poke it back up again, change jackets like a new character. But I went out with the, uh, the Hart Foundation and, and uh, Dangerous Danny Davis, our referee, against Tito Santana and the British Bulldogs. So we had that match, came back, changed jackets, went back out again two matches later with a honky-tonk man against Jake Roberts and Alice Cooper, where I got the snake thrown on me, came back, changed jackets again, and then I went out with Rowdy Roddy Piper and Adrian Adonis in the hair versus lose or leave the town or territory match. So when I got back, I was able to watch a couple of the matches after that, but I was so happy to get through everything because I was trying to remember everything I was supposed to do, what was happening. But uh, after looking back on it, it was kind of a milestone back then because we didn't know what it was going to do, how many people were going to come to it. And we knew the Pope had been there a couple of weeks before and had a sellout. The Rolling Stones had been there for a sellout. But uh, I think our figures kind of beat everything back then, over 93,000 people. So it was such a thrill for me. So thank you for mentioning that. Absolutely. And Ron, yeah. Scott, on the mat, on the field, in the ring, what kept that motivation fired for you guys? Yeah, for me, yeah, right. The, the, the motivation daily back then and i say daily and sometimes twice you know uh a, a day that we had to go on was the interaction with the fans right the getting that response was from the fans and this business that's that's motivating you understand me getting that positive response or the negative response in our business right is what we thrive off of right and, and also let me just take this opportunity now 
to be thankful and grateful that I'm in this position now to say thank you to some of you that are in this room or all of you. It's been a great ride for me and thank you for everything. It's been good. Yeah. Yeah, with all the fans, Russell wouldn't exist, you know, so, but for me, like Ron, I had, you know, come to college, I had to wrestle three, you know, work out three times a day, like yeah. run in the morning, practice in the afternoon, then run again at night, because you had to cut weight, you know, yeah. and then uh, I wasn't ready to be done with competition, I didn't felt like I didn't reach my, reach my physical peak, and I had a teaching degree, and I wasn't going to be a teacher, so I wanted to make money. So that's what, you know, my motivation. Outstanding. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So I know we've been mentioning a lot about how, you know, back in your guys' time, you know, things were really good. And I agree with that. It was a very good time. Is there anything about today's product that you'll find redeeming? Like anything good that is actually coming out today? Besides Braun Breaker. I know you're... <laughs> I actually didn't hear the question. He, he was it basically he was asking of today's product. If you watch uh, of anything that you've seen of a current product, whether it be WWE, AEW, is there anything out there that compared stands to, out to you that's compared that's, to back at well, the end of the day? That, that may have some right? redeeming quality, some hope for yeah. the future. Let's right. say. Well, the, I, as you just said, right? That hope, right? That you know, slowly I see this evolving to where they're going to learn to interject this blend of new style where they've got with yes. some of what is, you know, this business was founded on, right? And I think it's coming there, right? They ain't got there yet, all right? Because it's the emotional roller coaster all right, of what I think a fan should go through when they come to a professional wrestling match should cover all of it. Not just one thing, everyone chanting, you know, it's good, bad, hate, hope, all that should be involved. You understand? Absolutely. And right there, and that's, that's the way I see it. Right yeah, match, matches don't draw. You throw two guys together, if there's no emotional value or, you know, people don't have, you know, emotional on either side, it doesn't mean anything. You can throw two guys together, who cares? There's got to be a storyline or something. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, yeah, what's the point? Exactly, it's, yeah. It's the same in boxing and everything, same thing in football. There's got to be a buildup, you know. There's got to be, you know. It's fun to watch some of the guys jump around and do some of the amazing things they do, but when you're invested in the storyline, it makes you mean the big money draw is with the story for sure. Jimmy? You know, what? I, when I was watching NXT, because I try to watch all the shows all the time, Raw, SmackDown, and that, but uh, about a year ago, Terry Taylor was talking to me, and he said, do you see anybody that really stands out? And I went, man, yeah, this girl, Bianca Belair. I said, she reminds me of Left Eye Lopez. Uh, Local Tennessee girl, by the way. Yeah, left out Lopez, and I said, man, she really stands out. I said, she's got the showmanship. She's good in the ring. She's got the look. She seems like she can talk, and I'll be darned four or five, not because I said it, but four or five months later, all of a sudden, she's up there and doing tremendous now. So a lot of stars do come from there. You know, Seth Rollins is from the NXT. Mm -hmm. They had uh, Roman Reigns was there. They've had Becky Lynch came from there. I mean, you name it, it seems like that's the current... Uh, influx of the talent that they so there's no more territories anymore so that's so it's pretty smart of them putting something like that together uh and like i said Braun breaker he really stands out so much now and i'm not saying it because scott or or, or his dad's son but uh he's he's very good absolutely he is uh any other questions anybody uh, got a couple more come on up come on up thank you guys for being here uh, my question was, who was a fellow wrestler that you never had a chance to work in a program with that you would have liked to and why necessarily that uh, uh, that would have been a success for you? Well, for me, man, I, you know, to be honest with you, I think I've got the opportunity to work with all the ones that I could have imagined that let's, I've wanted to work with. Let's that question then, maybe a short list of some no. of your favorite people to work with. I, it, it, you know what? I, I can't do that. You know, because I, I, I honestly, you know, I've been very fortunate to span several generations of working with guys. I, I, it's impossible. That's a know? great answer. Yeah. He got to work with everybody yeah. he wanted to. Scott, yeah. how about you? Yeah, like I wrestled most of the tag teams there is, you know, that, uh, Butch and Ron, they were, you know, a lot of them were great. You know, it's like 
you really can't, uh, you know, it's really hard to top a tag and tag team uh, re- guys who wrestled. But as far as singles, I probably, when I went, I wish I would have been healthy when I could have wrestled Stone Cold. But I wrestled him in WCW, but he was coisy. He wasn't near the, the character he was in WWF and the, and the Rock, you know. But it, I, I wanted to go to SmackDown, but they put me on Raw. And, so probably those two. Good deal. You go know, ahead, sports, me, as far as managing teams go, we were able to, me and the Nasty Boys were able to go with Paul Lettering, you know, and the Road Warriors and the Hart Foundation. We were against uh, Slick and... and um, Nikola Volkov in the Iron Sheet and Jimmy Cornett. When I was in Memphis, Jimmy Cornett had the Midnight Express and I had the Bruise Brothers. So I got to go down to Bill Watts and go against those teams. I wish we could have worked against some of Paul Heyman's people, but because uh, I love Paul, but uh, you know, maybe down the line, who knows what the future yeah, holds. Yeah, you never know. You never know. All right, last fan question for the day. So with uh, everybody kind of just being a generic MMA guy now, what's your favorite like old school gimmick? Like Glacier or or uh, Bar- Bruder- Brutus the Barber Beefcake, Jake the Snake, that kind of just just straightforward gimmick. What was your favorite you saw? I was a big there? fan of Macho Man. Yeah. I'm no, sorry, who was that? What was that? Yeah. That, okay. but, because I mean, I, when I became good friends with him, I rolled with him. We were in WWE. I'm sorry, who did you say? Macho Man. Oh yeah. No, he was he was cool. He's nice. He, we got along great. Uh, I mean, nice guy. Uh, competitive, we always had, I mean, he always wanted where we, wherever we wanted to race in, you know, we were racing one time, we beat him forward, so then, oh, let's go backwards. So I, so I raced him, beat him backwards, okay, let's do the carry, you know, ride si- sideways. He, he was so competitive, but yeah. He was going to find a way to win. <laughs> yeah, he was a great character, and he ended up being my friend, so it That's was awesome. cool. Yeah, I think for me, man, I'm going to have to go with Dusty. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I always used to sit there when I was starting to write and dream of one day getting to be able to get a response from the from the fans like him. You know, watching the people crying and getting a different reaction from him. It it was unreal to sit there as a fan. I'm looking at it. You know, yeah, I yeah, those, I got to go with it. Those are awesome answers because think about this: if you apply those gimmicks to these guys, the Macho Man Scott Steiner. <laughs> And the American Dream, Ron Simmons, yeah. that works, man. Yeah. That works. Book it. Yeah. With Jimmy Hart managing them, <laughs> here we go. Yeah. You never know. Anything yeah. can happen. We've in the- always got the megaphone to throw you in. Got, you got another match in your run? Yeah, they ain't, yeah, the only thing you can say to that is, damn. <laughs> yeah. Hey, thank you guys for coming in today. We appreciate you. We love you. Uh, if you get a chance, go by, say hello to everybody at the tables. We've got... Uh, Mike Rotundo out there with us, over in our shyster, of course, and Ted DiBiase. So uh, if you get a chance, come by and say hello to us. Other than that, we love you. Thank you all guys for coming out today, okay? Thank yes, you. Yes, indeed. Thank you to, uh, to uh, Music City Multicon, and big thanks, Scott Steiner, Ron Simmons, and Jimmy Hart. <laughs>